Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 50. That's right, we've made it to 50 episodes so far, February 28th to March 6th, 1862. Last week, we talked about a few events. We set up the campaign that will culminate in the Battle of Pea Ridge in Arkansas. We had the inauguration of Jefferson Davis and the Legal Tender Act. Finally, we fought the Battle of Valverde, which is the first larger-scale engagement in New Mexico. Although still small in comparison to the battles we have had been seeing in the East. This week, I want to mess a little with our timeline and give a full account of the Siege of New Madrid and Island Number 10. Now, this campaign will actually occur from the start date of February 28th well into April, but I think that the story might flow a little bit better if we just hammer it all out now here in one episode. For the next couple of weeks, I will try to pop in some of these major events so that we get the full context of the timeline and what's going on. First, though, we will backtrack just a little bit to last week to mention what is going on in Tennessee. Before we do that, though, I just want to remind everybody that the Patreon episode Santa Fe Trail, it's an Errol Flynn movie from 1940 that also stars Ronald Reagan. That is posted on the Patreon feed. There is also a new Patreon content episode coming out here in March and it's going to be something a little bit different. Uh, I have some pictures from the modern-day battlefield of Pea Ridge that I'm going to be throwing on there and talking about the images that you'll be seeing in a slideshow fashion. So it's going to be a little bit different from the other Patreon episodes that I've been doing, and you know, hopefully you find that enjoyable. So keep checking, and I will remind everybody when that gets posted. But here, let's get into Tennessee. Briefly, I want to mention the capture of Nashville, which occurred on February 25th, 1862. As the remnants of the Confederate defenders at Fort Donelson arrived in Nashville, the writing was definitely on the wall for the Confederates there. Don Carlos Buell advanced on the city and arranged with the mayor a peaceful surrender of the major industrial center. Troops under the command of Bull Nelson and William Hazen would come ashore from the USS Cairo, anchoring before the city. A retired sea captain living in the city would offer a flag to fly over the Tennessee capital to replace the rebel colors. Nelson ordered the 6th Ohio to carry out the task. The regiment from then on known as the Old Glory Regiment. Nashville's surrender was not quite a knockdown blow to the Confederacy, but as we have already pointed out, it was a key manufacturing center and contained an armory. Federal occupation of the city would be another event in a chain that potentially started at Mill Springs that will lead us very shortly to the Battle of Shiloh in April. Before we get into events surrounding New Madrid, and island number 10, I think we need to talk a little bit about geography and explain what is going on with island number 10. New Madrid, spelled New Madrid, is a town in Missouri along the Mississippi River. Uniquely, this essentially is where Missouri meets with Kentucky and Tennessee. The river takes a hairpin turn at New Madrid going 180 degrees north to south. Now this is definitely where I want to include a map to help us better understand what is going on here, but I like to think about a, a like the river essentially is making the letter N with the right upright coming from the north. Where that slanted line meets the right upright sits island number 10. Now, either you understand exactly what I'm saying, or you are pausing 
right this second to go look at a map, hopefully posted on the website. And once again, the website is posted in the description. Island number 10 is named so because it is the 10th island from where the Mississippi meets the Ohio. So if you are curious why exactly it is named so, then there you go. Island number 10 sat right where the river took a northern turn, a good spot for defense. The Confederates had placed minor emphasis on fortifying the island and the nearby town of New Madrid, which would be on the top of the left upright for our letter N, with the strong rebel position of Columbus farther upriver, it did not seem necessary. In addition, the use of Confederate regiments for the purpose did not go as planned, considering that they saw the work as beneath them, a common problem as we have already mentioned. That would change with the fall of Forts Henry and Donelson, as well as the capture of Nashville and the occupation of Middle Tennessee. With all of that going on, Columbus would become an untenable position. PGT Beauregard had come to command the Army of Mississippi, essentially becoming second in command under Albert Sidney Johnson. They would withdraw troops from Columbus and focus on Island Number 10. Beauregard would not be present to command directly. Remember, he had fallen ill. Another reason he was unable to be present at Fort Donelson. It would fall to John McCown to take command of the troops there. McCown was a Tennessee native who attended West Point. He was breveted after the Battle of Cerro Gordo during the war with Mexico. After commanding under Braxton Bragg, he would spend the rest of the war bouncing around without really a whole lot to do. During the siege, McCown would be replaced by William Mackle. Mackle was also a West Point graduate from the same class as Braxton Bragg. He was wounded in the Seminole War. At the outbreak of the Civil War, he would serve on the staff of Albert Sidney Johnson. Later, he will serve in a similar capacity for Joseph E. Johnson. After the war, he will reside on a farm in Fairfax County, Virginia. In early 1862, batteries would be placed on Island Number 10, and two forts would be erected around New Madrid, named Fort Thompson and Fort Bankhead. Fort Thompson was actually named after our acquaintance M. Jeff Thompson, commanding troops there. 24 guns were placed on the shore above Island Number 10, and 19 on the batteries stationed on the island itself. Forts Thompson and Bankhead would share 21 guns between them. All in all, there's actually a good force of arms for the Southerners. The real strength in Island Number 10 lay in the fact that there was just one land approach, this being from Tiptonville, Tennessee, which lay to the south on the east bank of the Mississippi River. Because of this, the position was considered to be invulnerable, especially with the land batteries sitting on that side of the river. Swampland lay across from the island, combined with dense forest in that area. While the guns would not have quite the advantage they had in being elevated as they had at Columbus, they would not have the disadvantage of being flooded on lower ground, such as Fort Henry. In the best case scenario for the Union, the gunboats would be on an even footing in terms of field of fire with the Confederate defensive works. The Confederates would have a strength of some 7,000 to 9,000 men, 
and the addition of a small amount of naval support given by Flag Officer Hollins, who you recall we met at New Orleans. The Mississippi River Defense Fleet being his command. There would be approximately eight vessels, the most important being the CSS McRae, with seven guns under Lieutenant Thomas Huget. In fact, the CSS Manassas, that participated at Head of Passes, was scheduled to be present during the siege, but it was unable to move through more shallow waters to get there. Another interesting weapon from the Confederate Navy was the CSS New Orleans, which was a floating battery containing 16 guns and could be raised and lowered using valves. Henry Halleck would again wish to strike at the Confederates and clear this obstruction from his Department of Missouri. Much in the same way he has released Grant and Curtis, he will release his next army. So, facing off against the Confederate Army of Mississippi would be the Union Army of Mississippi and their commander, John Pope. Pope will be one of the more interesting figures of the war. I think he gets a little bit of a bad rap for Second Manassas, and to be fair, this is probably deserved. He was also not well liked by the South, displaying more of a hardline policy toward secessionists than, say, George B. McClellan. This would be because John Pope is a radical Republican, or at least more radical uh, certainly than the Democrat McClellan is. February of 1862, he would command some 10,000 men to start, eventually reaching a number closer to some 23,000. He would be supported by the Western Flotilla under the command of Andrew Hull Foote. His numbers were supplemented by 14 mortar rafts, each of them housing one 13-inch mortar. These were actually under army control to make things more confusing. Serving under Pope are a few interesting figures, Schuyler Hamilton, Joseph Plummer, and John Palmer, among others. Schuyler Hamilton should sound like an interesting name for the Hamilton fans out there. He was the grandson of Alexander Hamilton, attending West Point before serving on the Plains. During the war with Mexico, he was wounded, but served as an aide-de-camp under Winfield Scott. During the war, Hamilton will fall sick and resign from the army. He will spend the rest of his days in New York City until his death which was not at the hands of the grandson of Aaron Burr in a duel. Joseph Plummer was a Massachusetts native who attended West Point, but at the time of the outbreak of the war was actually teaching a local high school. We have actually met him before, as he commanded a battalion of regulars at the Battle of Wilson's Creek. Plummer had been wounded during that engagement, and unfortunately died due to complications from this wound at the Siege of Corinth there later in 1862. John McCauley Palmer was a Kentucky native and eventual senator from that state. Palmer practiced law before going into politics as an anti-slavery Democrat. He'll be involved with the founding of the Republican Party. Palmer will be with us for some time, eventually commanding the Department of Kentucky. He's going to switch back to the Democratic Party later in life, becoming the vice presidential nominee for the Gold Democrats. Pope and his army would move through the winter conditions and less than ideal roadways to reach New Madrid in early March. Because of these conditions for the roadways, artillery lagged behind the Union troops. 
despite there being light skirmishing, there was little in terms of larger scale operation. New Madrid was seen as the weakest part of the rebel defense. It had a good position along the river, but it was open to the north. Union troops advanced without artillery support in an effort to storm the two rebel positions, but were turned back after taking fire from the forts as well as the Confederate Navy. In fact, the Confederate Navy performed well in firing on any Union attempt at the forts. Confederate infantry, writing that their courage was bolstered at the fire from the Brownwater fleet. McCown waited until Pope was able to bring up his artillery, and then requested heavy guns he needed for a potential siege before making a move. It was thought by the commanding officer that the heavy guns would not be able to be moved through the swamp and reach New Madrid, much to their surprise. In addition, Pope had sent Palmer and Palmer further south on the Missouri side of the river. Palmer had captured Point Pleasant, which would be a key communications area with Tiptonville and potential resupply for Forts Bankhead and Thompson. Palmer would move even further south and capture Riddles Point for the same purpose, giving the southern shore a heavy federal flavor. Hollins would attempt to bombard the Union positions, but they would simply withdraw out of range. Pope would receive artillery and bombard New Madrid and the Confederate forts around this time. McCown would see that New Madrid would have to be abandoned after holding a council of war. Confederate forces would withdraw from the town, leaving it to be captured by the Union Army on March 14th. Pope was just as shocked as anyone that the enemy had withdrawn, essentially without a fight. So bungled had the operation of retreat been that the Confederates had left behind 33 pieces of artillery and many small arms, or at least these were the numbers that were claimed by Pope in his report. Some question there with Pope as to whether he is constantly bolstering himself up in an effort to rise through the ranks of the military. So um, I will say we can take those numbers with a grain of salt. Rebels would be scattered either to Island Number 10 or Tiptonville, Tennessee. Some would move on from there even further to the south, the next strong point on the Mississippi River being Fort Pillow. Confederate naval forces would withdraw below Tiptonville due to a battery that had been constructed by the Union Army at Riddles Point. They would not play a part in the remainder of the campaign. In late March, McCown would be relieved of command, Mackle taking over. Surprisingly, it was not due to poor performance that McCown was being removed. In fact, he received a promotion to Major General. Sort of an odd choice considering he did very little when Pope arrives. And yes, there was the factor of not expecting the Union Army to march in winter, but still probably not warranting a reward, one would think. McCown was also hoping that reinforcements would arrive from Earl Van Dorn and his Army of the West, but as we have already mentioned, they were soon to be occupied in Arkansas. McCown would take command at Fort Pillow and take with him several regiments of rebel infantry, thus weakening the garrison at Island No. 10 even more. Those that had been left behind would be depleted by the constant Union fire and manual labor of preparing and repairing defenses. Pope would move artillery into position and combine with the Western Flotilla underfoot to bombard Island No. 10. Officially, the shelling would commence on March 15th and last for the next two weeks. Pope would not get along with Foote the same way Grant did, 
And to be fair, I think Foote was probably still affected by the action at Fort Donelson, making him a little more cautious. Foote would actually write that he would not be unprepared moving forward. He was definitely still feeling the effects of the wound he had received, moving around on crutches. His Navy needed to supplement manpower with infantry volunteers and those who had any kind of naval experience on the Great Lakes. It should also be noted that the Mississippi River flows down, therefore it would be more difficult to fire on the rebel batteries. Other rivers had flown in the opposite direction, so Foote was able to have his vessels steam forward, fire, and then withdraw using the current. There would be a brief action using ironclad vessels, but the fire would be ineffective. Pope wanted to use a strategy of steaming past the fort, which probably would have been more devastating at Fort Donelson. Foote would argue against and keep up the longer range fire on Island Number 10. Little damage was inflicted on either side. In fact, the USS St. Louis suffered the most damage when a gun exploded on board, killing several members of the crew. Mortar fire would be key in the battle for Island Number 10, as they would bear most of the hard labor. Lincoln had actually taken a personal interest in the success of the mortars. Remember, Lincoln is the only sitting U.S. president to hold a patent, and he was interested in this new, sort of cobbled-together army fleet, in fact, of mortars and how they would fare on the Mississippi River. In the meantime, Pope decided to take on quite the feat of engineering. In order to connect the flotilla with New Madrid without having to move past the batteries on Island Number 10, Union troops would dig a bypass canal north of the island through the bayou. Incredibly, the canal was 50 feet wide and 12 miles long. It was completed in just 19 days. On April 4th, Shallow bottom vessels, such as troop transports, could pass through. All the while, a pass at the Confederate fort was seen as something that could be successful, but Foote was reluctant. At this time, the CSS Virginia had done severe damage to the Union blockade in Virginia. If any of his ironclads fell into Confederate hands, he felt that it could be used against them to turn the tide on the Mississippi. On March 29th, Commander Walk of the USS Carondelet volunteered to pass his vessel by Island Number 10 in order to break the siege. He would do so on April 4th. The vessel lashed with coal barges for extra protection against potential artillery fire. An additive measure was a raid conducted by 40 infantrymen, spiking some of the Confederate guns on the mainland across from the island. USS Carondelet suffered only two hits while passing. Two nights later, the USS Pittsburgh also snuck by the defenders. Mackle would understand that his position was becoming a problem and potentially Pope was gearing up for an assault with infantry and the Navy, which he would not be able to stand. Confederate forces on the mainland batteries started to withdraw toward Tiptonville, but Pope was informed of this move. Smelling blood in the water, he would move his forces across the Mississippi and cut them off, forcing their surrender. On April 8th, Island Number 10 would surrender to Foote and his western flotilla. Pope would exaggerate the claims of how many men were captured, listing some 7,000 taken, although McCall listed the entire garrison as being around 5,000. Union losses for the entire campaign were 8 killed, 21 wounded, 
with likely similar numbers besides prisoners for the Confederates. If you are looking ahead on our timeline, you will notice that the fall of Island Number 10 is the same time relatively as the Battle of Shiloh, at that time the largest battle of the war. So Pope's victory was overlooked at the time. Still, this would open more of a stretch along the Mississippi River and remove the final Confederate stronghold in Missouri. We can go ahead and pause right there. This week we spent the entire time in or around Island Number 10. John Pope had gained a little bit of fame, which will pay off for him down the road. More of the Mississippi River is open for Union travel. Missouri is officially a loss to the Southern cause as well. The state will be a star for the Union from here on out. Next week, we will, at the very least, fight the Battle of Pea Ridge as Van Dorn and Curtis collide in northwest Arkansas. If you like what you hear, please make sure to leave a review. Posted in the description should be a link to the website, Patreon, as well as Venmo information. Support for the general upkeep of the show is greatly appreciated. Once again, feedback is welcome. Questions, comments, concerns. The email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. Thank you all so much for listening, and have a great week.